Good afternoon, everyone. We'll get started. Um, welcome to the Near Little Brain Club lecture series. Um, today we have um, Dr. Pillar Castro from Pediatric Anesthesiology. Um, she is uh, uh, the director of the fellowship uh, program in pediatric anesthesia and uh, she has a special interest in neonatal anesthesia. Um, she is going to talk about the neonatal brain anesthesia and pain management. Um, please welcome. Please uh, welcome Dr. Castro to give the talk. Uh, before starting the talk, uh, please mute your microphones Hello? and uh, don't put us on hold, please. Thank you. All right. Okay. Thank you so much uh, for the invitation uh, um, to the neonatology team here at the Cleveland Clinic and to everybody else around the world. Uh, it's a pleasure for me to be uh, sharing with you a little bit of the newest information that we have about anesthesia and the developing brain. So I was going to start with some questions, but I will go ahead and do them at the end. It, the idea was just to uh, understand a little bit how much you knew about the potential for neurotoxicity in the developing brain and the conversation that we are having uh, in the pediatric anesthesia community uh, on how to handle the information that we have so far. So we'll move on to doing that at the end. So we all know that the moment that we all have a child or you have a niece or a nephew, you want that child to grow to be a happy and to reach happy child and to read to reach their full potential. As you can see, there are multiple books. I'm sure that many of you have, that our parents have a lot of these parenting books. Uh, and a lot of them are trying to explain to you uh, how uh, the, the brain development occurs during these first years and what can we do to, um, to make it even better. And for the neonatology community and for the pediatric anesthesia community, this, become, this becomes uh, an issue since we, uh, um, have to manage these very fragile patients either in the operating room for short periods of time or for you in the neonatal intensive care unit for longer periods of time. So my objectives today are going to be to discuss the existing evidence of the potential of neurotoxicity of general anesthetics on the developing brain. I want also to bring up a little bit of what the American and not only the American but the European perspective is on the topic of the FDA warning. So what we pediatric anesthesiologists are saying in the United States and what are the European, uh, our European colleagues thinking about it. Um, I also want to tell you what the implications of these are for what we're telling the parents, are we changing our practices or not? And then the last thing that I want to talk about is a little bit about regional anesthesia in the neonate and some new data that we have about that. So it wasn't until 1987 that this like, landmark article by Anand and colleagues uh, was published in the New England Journal of Medicine. Up until that point, um, most of my colleagues um, at, of that generation pretty much will bring the patient to the operating room, uh, start an IV, give a mass relaxant, and the surgeons will, we will continue operating without any further anesthetic care. And it wasn't until 1987 that these made um, the scientific studies start improving the impact that the surgical injury had on these babies. Um, and it was told um, and this, uh, suggested of the necessity uh, of um, employing an anesthetics uh, and analgesics in the neonatal population. As you can see here, it was on the same month in November of 1987 that even the New York Times um, published this, uh, and I couldn't find the, the real paper, I couldn't access the archives, but pretty much this is the, the online version, and it says infant sense of pain is recognized finally. So anybody who may have been anesthetized in the 70s or the early 80s may have been <laughs> pretty much tortured by not being properly anesthetized. So taking into consideration that we cannot not anesthetize patients though, 
Uh, when the FDA uh, warning came up in 2016 in regards to the potential of neurotoxicity in the developing brain, uh, the anesthesia community was very surprised. Uh, and um, many people thought it was a, a, an effort to inform the community, but that there wasn't enough clinical and even animal data to make such an announcement public. Um, but pretty much what they're saying is that consistent with animal studies, recent human studies suggest that a single relatively short exposure, at that point the FDA, seeing the backlash from the pediatric anesthesia community, tried to reassure the community by saying that a single exposure in infants or toddlers is unlikely to have negative effects on behavior or learning. However, further research is needed to, can, to characterize um, any further exposure on children's brain development. Um, at that point though, uh, because of all the preclinical data uh, and the data on animals uh, and the causing neuroapoptosis on, on all these rats, rodents and primates, um, and the controversial human data uh, that I will tell you all about, the FDA decided to put pretty much label on label of a warning label on all general anesthetics. Um, again, they continue saying, about, uh, insisting on the importance of continuing research. And they also encourage uh, the, the importance of considering carefully if cases could be delayed in children uh, in whom uh, surgeries and anesthesia, of course, was required before three years of age. So this is the list of our most common general anesthetics and as you can see, uh, pretty much everything except opioids is in this list. All the inhalational agents, the benzodiazepines, etomidate, ketamine and the barbiturates all have pretty much FDA warning labels. So you must be thinking, well, why is this a relevant topic? Well, the neonatologists spend their time calculating, making sure every single baby is comfortable, then minimizing pain, making sure transitioning is adequate and all these things. We spend, compared to you in the neonatal intensive care, in care, intensive care unit, a way shorter time, but a very intense time. Approximately six million children are anesthetized in the United States, of which two to three million um, are less than three years old, and about a million and a half are infants. Um, not only that, but um, there is a, a, a lot of growth in the fetal uh, surgery. Uh, there's a lot of development in, in that regard, so even fetuses are being anesthetized or getting the effect of some of the anesthesia that is being delivered to the mother. So up to 2014, there were 1,500 fetal interventions in the United States. And as you can see here, my uh, chair, Dr. Dorothea Markakis, uh, inducing uh, one of our patients into general anesthesia, wearing all the protective equipment, as you can tell. So besides the numbers, why is this important? Well, uh, this cartoon sort of gives you an idea of the whole process and how complicated the process is of the developing brain. So the neurogenesis starts really, really early in the um, fetal development. So around eight weeks gestation, it occurs quickly and it continues during birth. Then uh, there is gliogenesis, the synaptogenesis that continue occurring until the teenage years. The myelination that we know very well occurs, occurs also since early, uh, early, relatively early gestation and the increase in white matter as well. There's this concept of synaptic pruning where the axons differentiate into the dendrites and when that doesn't happen adequately, there's lack of appropriate synaptogenesis as well. There's, so as you can see, between uh, the last um, weeks of a fetal development and during the first few years of life, there is a significant brain growth spurt. So we think this is the uh, timing when uh, 
pediatric patients are more sensitive to changes in their brain architecture due to the, due to the anesthetics. So how did this all start? Um, in 2000, there was a, publish, a, a study published uh, in Science by Economillo and Vitago, and I don't know if I'm pronouncing the names appropriately, but what they did is they took rats and they exposed them to ethanol, and then they looked at their brains, uh, and they were able to replicate the effect of fetal alcohol syndrome, and they came to the conclusion that the ethanol causes neuropoptosis by two different mechanisms. One is NMDA antagonism, and then the other one is GABA-A activation. And if we think about this carefully, what happens is that these two mechanisms, mechanisms of action are pretty much the two mechanisms of actions that we understand our general aesthetics work with. Again, uh, these rats were studied during their uh, most vulnerable uh, period uh, of synaptogenesis, which is like P7 day of life for them. Uh, and that's when the anesthesia community uh, started looking into it and they started doing research uh, in exposing animals to general anesthetics. So the whole debate for the pediatric anesthesia community started with this landmark arc article of 2003 uh, by um, Todorovic, Harman, and, and, and colleagues. And they looked again at rats and, uh, and all the animal data that they were able to look at up to that point. They ex exposed these rats to um, isoflurane, to midazolam, uh, and they realized that there was worse performance, especially when it came to behavioral, cognitive, and memory related testing. The problem though is that, as I was explaining, uh, uh, pretty much all our, uh, all our sedatives and anesthetics either work with one, one way or the other. So ketamine and nitrous and our NMDA, NMDA antagonists and everything else acts via GABA agonism, the benzodiazepines, the additional agents, propofol and etomate. So what were the risk factors that they found the combination of agents of, or medications, so the fact that if you gave uh, the rat one anesthetic agent was not as, as, was not as bad as if, as if you combined multiple anesthetics. And then they also um, uh, theorized the potential of, of looking into these animals in a very critical period of synaptogenesis. What about nitrous oxide? So nitrous oxide is used uh, for the colleagues in the UK that are uh, listening, uh, is used in ambulances. Here in the United States, it's used in dental offices. So it's a very common uh, sedative or anesthetic. The one published study of nitrous as a single agent also indicated neuropoptosis, and that it occurs at, mass, uh, at concentrations of about 70%. Uh, now, if you add to that a general aesthetic like sevoflurane, uh, the data also is significant in non-human primates as well. What are the proposed mechanisms of disruption of this synaptogenesis uh, of general anesthesia in the developing brain? Again, this is work in progress, uh, but as we know, and I show you in that cartoon before, there is this quick growth, melanation, pronation, uh, synaptogenesis, so it, it's thought that all these processes are, alt are altered, that the axon dendrite polarization is disrupted by anesthetic agents like isoflurane and propofol, and then ketamine seems to also impair the formation of dendrites, uh, in, especially in gaba ergic neurons. So uh, when I started like looking a little bit deeper, digging deeper in, into all these concepts, the idea of epigenetics came to, to light, at least for me. And uh, the definition is something close to what is the influence of the, that the environment has in our genes and in the uh, demonstration of those genes in the production of different proteins. And it looks like the general aesthetics can have actually an impact in the way proteins are expressed, especially in the developing brain of these animals. And all of this, of course, is animal data, not human data. Again, uh, 
very similarly, ethanol has a very, it has a, a very um, similar mechanism of action, which is a down regulation of the brain derived natriuretic factor, which actually promotes synapses and pro pro promotes uh, generation of, of neurons. So there are two pathways for, that are proposed as mechanisms of action for neuroapoptosis. There's the intrinsic pathway that implies a little bit of an effect on the mitochondria, and there is another one that is the extrinsic pathway. Um, no matter what, the thought is that there's general suppression of this neurotrophic synaptic signaling, and there's decrease uh, in the brain uh, um, derived uh, factor, um, which leads to apoptosis. And as you can see here, there's uh, the extrinsic apopto apoptotic cascade that gets activated via uh, the mitochondria. And then there's caspase 9, which is produced, which increases apoptosis. And the same thing happens with the extrinsic apoptotic cascade via different mechanism. So the internal signals, like, as I explained, activate a mitochondrial dependent pathway. So again, a lot of uh, information is being developed in mitochondrial disorders or how important all that um, energy uh, that the mitochondria stores is, is critical even for brain development here. So what do we know about the preclinical data? Most studies are in animals, and then one of the uh, disadvantages of all these studies is that there's no surgical simulation. So they pretty much take the rats at a critical period of their development, and they expose them to general aesthetics, and then they look at their brains and see is histologically what happens. So surgery itself, uh, anesthesia itself may be protective when there is a t where there's tissue injury, right? Um, the other disadvantage is that in many of the studies, the doses of anesthetics that are used in all the animal data are extremely high. So you cannot extrapolate that to what happens in humans, like the ketamine studies. And then there's mixed results as well. Some studies show that the effects may be reversible, while other studies don't show that. So the question is, can we extrapolate this to humans? And obviously we cannot randomize people to have anesthesia and not have anesthesia and then look at their brains or any markers. So there's several limitations of the studies in rodents and primates. First of all, that different doses are required, uh, that there's different periods of development and do we understand which one is the really critical period in the animals or in the, um, or in the human uh, uh, as well. And then how do we, how do we measure the consequences of that. What do we consider neurobehavioral outcomes and what, what is it that really matters and is clinically relevant? And then it is very, I cannot imagine how they control the anesthetic, especially in the rats. Uh, how can they measure if they're being well oxygenated? How can they measure that their blood pressure is not like that they're not constantly hypotensive, that kind of, that kind of um, finesse in the anesthetic has to be very difficult. And then the unknown influence of surgery. Now, let me tell you though that I'm talking about rats here, but a lot of the studies have been done in non-human primates as well. And the data in non-human primates also shows neuroapoptosis, and I'm sure they can control uh, all those physiologic variables better. So what is the unknown? We don't know which children are prone and vulnerable, vulnerable to, to the potential neurotoxic effect of anesthesia. We don't know the age, we don't know the doses, we don't know the length of the anesthetic. We don't know which neurological domains are affected. Is it verbal? Is it learning and memory? Is it social? Is it math? Uh, we, we, we don't know any of that. And then we don't, know if the, um, the mechanisms of the association between <coughs> surgery itself <coughs> and the anesthetic act, act and the importance of controlling for hypotension, for the potential for hypoxemia, uh, for uh, hypoperfusion and how that can affect the outcome and the potential neurotoxic effect of the, of the anesthetic uh, agents. And again, how surgery or anesthesia may be neuroprotective. Um, the other area that is quite interesting, and they started exploring in animals, is how, what interventions do, can we do to potentially minimize 
the, the, the poor neuro, neurodevelopmental outcome in humans. Are moms reading enough to their kids? Are they stimulating them enough? Th that, that kind of idea. And, and I'll show you later a study uh, in rodents where they um, enhance their environment after the anesthetic and how that actually made the whole uh, effect that the anesthesia had had before go away. Okay, so now I'm going to move on a little bit to the humans to talk about the human studies, and there are a lot of them, but I'm just going to focus on a few. There are retrospective studies, and there are also uh, some prospective clinical studies that have given us uh, some light uh, into the problem. Uh, the retrospective studies are usually cohort studies and are population-based studies, and these are some of the most important ones. And in the last 12 to 15 years, there have been uh, at least the most important studies are the gas study that actually uh, I'm, I'm excited to show you the latest data on it that was just presented at the national meeting in October, and then the panda study that's been finalized, and the mask study as well. And of course, uh, they even have had the opportunity to look at uh, the brain through imaging and MRI and compare how people that have been anesthetized uh, brains uh, may compare to people that have not been exposed to anesthesia, children. Okay, so the, the first study was published in 2009 and is uh, a, the Mayo Clinic group, which is a, a very important group uh, that has looked at the neurotoxicity issue. And what they did is, um, the, the purpose of the study was to try to determine if there was an association between exposure of general anesthesia before four years of age and the development of le any learning disability in a population-based birth cohort. So they looked at patients anesthetized between 1976 and 1982, less than four years old. Anesthesia has changed significantly, again, over the last 20 years. We don't use the same general anesthetic, so these children were probably exposed to halothane, which we don't use, at least in the United States, as much, uh, we don't use anymore. Um, and I, again, they were also looking at uh, mostly uh, tests that were related to school outcome and how they were performing at school. At school. Um, what they ended up um, finding is that one or two more anesthetics, in, excluding children, again, this was, this, this was a last cohort, a, a really long and big cohort of patients, but if the patients were exposed to two or more anesthetics, then the kids had a higher incidence of a learning problems. So as you can see here, this is no exposure, one exposure, and this is multiple exposures. The, a prolonged anesthetic was also found to be a risk factor, and um, so this like created a lot of questions in the anesthesia community and the need to do more prospective studies instead of retrospective studies. Um, there were no increase again in learning uh, problems with just one anesthetic. Then in, in 2012, um, they looked at uh, a smaller cohort. These were only like 320 patients. Um, and they looked at if there was any um, effect of general anesthesia in the academic performance of children exposed to general anesthetics instead of being less than four years. These were younger children, so these were less than one year, and these were coming for very specific, specific procedures and were healthy kids, compared to the really big cohort from before where the kids were really sick, some of them. These were coming from inguinal hernia, circumcisions, and very common procedures, healthy kids again. What did they find? Uh, what did they look at? Uh, this was done in Iowa, and they were able to find, uh, uh, again, with this population cohort, two th 237 patients that were, were exposed to general anesthesia during infancy less than a year old, and they were compared with 133 patients that, uh, whose parents gave consent to study uh, their, their scores uh, at school in relation to their medical records. The result was that actually uh, the Iowa test that they give right before entering school 
uh, the, the scores were lower in the patients that were anesthetized compared to the general population. But in this study, um, there was a higher percentage of children that had very poor academic ad achievement below the fifth percentile. There was a subgroup though a, of very, very healthy patients that had no risk factors for CNR, CN, uh, cerebral uh, uh, nervous system problems that showed no significant difference in mean test scores. So the question was, are the lower scores correlated with longer surgeries and anesthetic? Is it because the severity of, this, of the disease? Because some of these kids had lower, the, the kids that had lower percentiles uh, scores potentially had more comorbidities. Uh, in the Netherlands, they tried to tackle the questions, the question of nature versus nurture, and this is actually a, a, a really um, interesting study where they looked at a twin registry in Holland, and they were able to find uh, 1,143 pairs of identical twins, and they were able to divide them in three groups. So the first group, the first group was concordant, non-exposed. So neither, neither twin was exposed to the anesthetic. The other group, one twin was exposed, the other one was not exposed. And the third group, both of them were exposed to general anesthesia. Then again, they, they, were, they were looking again at educational achievement and cognitive problems near age 12. So they have the ability to look, to, to look at these there. And this is why th what they found. The concordant exposed twins had lower scores than the concordant non-exposed twins. So this will make you think, oh, well, maybe the anesthetic is the problem here. But interestingly enough, the discordant twins, the exposed versus the non-exposed twins had no difference. So then, again, the question is out there. Is it nature versus, no versus, versus nurture? So it could be that simply having an anesthetic early in life, in life may be a marker for an individual's predisposition for later learning problems or comorbidities or, or things like that more than just the anesthetic itself. So again, the struggle of understanding nature versus nurture. And the last one that I wanted to bring to you that is also a retrospective uh, study um, is um, looking at assessment for kindergarten entrance, so are they ready to start kindergarten? And this study was done uh, in Canada. It's retrospective, as I explained, it's a cohort review. They looked at th almost 4,000 children that had one single general anesthetic and 620 that had two or more anesthetics, and they compared those kids to 13,000 non-exposed children, and then they look at how ready were they to start kindergarten and they did not find any association between anesthesia in children less than two years old and the readiness to start kindergarten. Uh, now, interestingly enough, a single exposure between two and four years of age was associated with deficits, especially in communication and general knowledge, with no greater risk conferred by multiple anesthetic exposures. So as you can see, I've shown you four retrospective studies and all of them are telling us very different things and we really don't have an answer and they have many confounding uh, factors here. So what would, can we conclude of our retrospective studies? Do we think the number of anesthetics may, may play a role? It makes sense, and some of the studies have shown that, so potentially yes. Um, is there a critical period for synaptogenesis? We think so, but we are not completely sure about it. Again, it makes sense. Does the duration of anesthesia matter? In all the preclinical studies we know, and on the, and all the animal data, we know the duration matters. And we will think that it makes sense for human studies as well, or for humans, that the duration of anesthesia matters. And then the genetic, the genetic factor could play a role. And in summary, all the retrospective studies left us with a lot of inconclusive data and, uh, and more questions than answers. So because of that, then uh, all, at least these three big uh, prospective and multi-center studies were, were organized and funded. 
So the first one was the gas, the gas study. It's general anesthesia versus regional anesthesia. And there's people from all over the world, uh, United States, Canada, uh, Europe, and Australia that have participated. The purpose is to establish if general anesthesia in, in infancy. And this is very important for the neonatology team because these are children that are less than 60 weeks post-conceptual age. And we were looking to see if general anesthesia versus regional anesthesia had different outcomes. Uh, what were they trying to measure? So they, their primary outcome is the WIPC3, which is the IQ um, quotient, the, the intelligence quotient full scale that was going to be done at five years old when these children turned five, which was actually this year. And then the secondary outcome was done at two years of age, and I'm going to show you what it, what, uh, it showed. So again, the primary result is the WIPC3 and the full scale IQ score performed at five, and the secondary result did not show a significant difference between both groups at two years old. What kind of study is it? Was prospective, blind, multi-center, international, randomized, and controlled. So pretty much people got the same anesthetic, either a very similar anesthetic, a, with health for the, for the most part a con in control uh, circumstances. The people that were on the regional cohort did not get any sedatives or any general aesthetics, and the people that have general aesthetics had uh, certain things that they were following that I'm not going to get into detail. All of them were little uh, babies, um, and this I, I love this is because I love this study because it it really looks at the population that you're interested in, which are the neonates. The mean age was 45 weeks post conceptual age, and 55% of this population were premature babies. So this that's why this study is so relevant. And we can see somebody doing a spinal on a small baby. So uh, I took this slide from the video, uh, the videos that we can get from our American Society of Anesthesia uh, presentation. And Dr. McCann from Boston Children's just showed the data of the gas study. So the five-year-old data, so the WIPC3 IQ scale score. So they were able to recruit a total of 700 and 22 patients that were randomized. 363 were assigned to a regional anesthesia group, 359 to the general anesthesia. You can see how the numbers were getting smaller and smaller until by five years, 242 on the general anesthesia group completed the WIPC3 assessment, and in the regional anesthesia, 205 completed the assessment. Thankfully, the result is very reassuring. What they found is that just under an hour of anesthesia in infancy does not seem to cause clinically significant um, adverse neurodevelopmental outcome as measured by the IQ at five years old. Now, what do they say are the potential limitations of the study? First of all, these were really short anesthetics. The mean anesthetic time, I think it was around 50, 50 minutes or so. So duration of exposure less than an hour. Exposure during a narrow period of, of infancy, these are most of them were 45 weeks, some of them were premature. More, most of the, of the babies were boys because this is inguinal hernia, circumcisions, that kind of thing. And then again, what if we cannot, what if we're using an instrument that is not detecting what could be affected? We're just only looking at a full scale. Now, at, at a more granular level, they really look at the different components, verbal and all of that, and they couldn't find any differences either. Okay, so now we're gonna move on to the second prospective study, which is the PANDA study, and this is actually a, a, a very interesting study as well, because here they're not only looking at little babies, they're looking at siblings. So again, they're trying to tackle the question of nurture versus nature, one more time. So the purpose was to examine if a single anesthetic before three years of age, so these were not neonates, these were older kids, had any effect on the neurocognitive development or behavior later in childhood. And those are my kids who are actually less than three years old and thankfully they have not been anesthetized, but 
<laughs> it's a prospective retrospective cohort study and the, you do comparison between siblings. One, is, one of them is exposed to general anesthesia. The other one is not exposed to general anesthesia. They're, they are less than three years old apart. Uh, it's for elective inguinal hernia repair. Uh, again, they're looking also at the non-exposed non sibling. And then the prim primary objective was looking at the IQ, doing all this testing. And the secondary objective was looking at a specific neurocognitive function such as memory, language, attention, and even executive function. The, uh, the testing was done between eight and 15 years. So that's why we're just looking at, we're just seeing the results of all these studies in the last three years because it took a long time to be able to like collect the data. Psychologists were blinded. There were a total of 105 pair of siblings, 90% uh, exposed group, and 56% of the known exposed group were male. So again, we have a higher incidence of, or, or a higher uh, group of boys being anesthetized and analyzed compared, compared to girls. All exposed siblings receive inhalational anesthesia. 28 others receive other stuff. So again, the data is not perfect, but is what we have. And what we found, what they found is that there were no differences in IQ between the child that was exposed to anesthesia and the child that was not, not exposed to anesthesia, uh, which is again reassuring, right? Again, these were really short anesthetics and these children were pretty healthy kids. So not children that are vulnerable because they were in the ICU or because they have congenital heart disease or anything like that. Um, and I wanted to bring this up, this study up to you also because besides, it probably the future is not only going to be uh, trying to look at this neurocognitive testing, but potentially looking at biomarkers or even imaging studies that can show us a difference of, uh, does it really clinically matter? So uh, this group uh, in 2017 published uh, this study where they compare 17 exposed children, 17 children that were exposed during infancy to anesthesia to 17 children that were not exposed and they looked at MRIs. And uh, of course they, they tried to make sure that there were no CNS factors affected, history of epilepsy, traumatic event, hypoxic injuries, or anything like that. The, the, the control for demographics, income, parental education, which actually the mother's um, degree of education is actually the most important determinant of achievement for the, for the kids. Um, and what they found is that the whole brain matter volume as a, as a percentage of, of intracranial volume was lower in the children that were exposed to anesthesia compared to the ones that were, were not exposed. It was 1.5% points lower. I don't know if this matters. I don't think they really know if this matters, but this was a finding, and that's why I'm, I'm showing this to you. They did not find any differences in gray matter or cerebrospinal fluid volume. Um, this last study too was just published and is the only study that's tried to look at the question of multiple exposures, which is the mask study. So this is the same group that, look, that published that cohort study that I presented in you, the first one, where they look at this big cohort of children. Uh, but then they, what they did was the following. They, the hypothesis was, does exposure to multiple but not single procedures requiring anesthesia before three years is associated with adverse ne neurodevelopmental neuro 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 outcomes? They uh, look at unexposed, they looked at single exposed and multiple exposed, again, the same cohort, which is the Olmsted County, Minnesota, uh, of patients from 1994 to 2007. And they, uh, all these children underwent testing between ages 8 to 12 or 15 to 20 years old. What was the primary outcome? Again, the same outcome that they looked in the GAS study as the primary outcome, which is the, the WIPC3 full scale for IQ. And this is what they found. There was no differences in IQ at all. If they were exposed to one anesthetic, 
versus multiple uh, anesthetics. Now, when they looked at processing, processing speed and fine motor abilities, it was, a, it was a little lower in the multiple exposure group. I don't, they, I don't know if they even know how meaningful this can be for the patient's um, achievement or performance later in life, but that's, that's one of the things that they found. found. Um, and again, it's reassuring and it's telling us that anesthesia before three years old was not associated with deficits in general intelligence, even when patients were exposed to multiple anesthetics. And this is the only study that's, that's looked at that. So, so I'm telling you all of this and you must be wondering, well, what are you telling the parents at the Cleveland Clinic? And I can tell you that we are not really telling the parents much unless the parents are asking us. But other, in other institutions, they've taken a very proactive way of dealing with this. And I'll show you, for instance, what they do at Texas Children's. What are surgeons telling the families? Well, I think that if we are not telling the, the families anything, the surgeons are not saying anything unless they're being asked. And then they re usually refer to refer the parents to talk to us so we can explain things. Now with the data that we had this year, I think is we can give, give the parents even more reassurance that there should not be significant consequences from being exposed to general anesthesia. What do the expert recommend? So in 2016, uh, they did a survey uh, that in which I participated as fellowship round director just to look at what fellowship round directors were thinking in the whole country and uh, just to have an idea of what the different institutions were doing with this information. Uh, th pretty much what they wanted to see was how the topic is being addressed in the different academic practices and the results were simply that there's no uniformity, there's no consensus and we really don't agree on how to deal with the situation and most of us think there's no need to tell the parents unless we're being asked and I'm going to show you a couple of the questions that were asked. Does your program discuss the risk of anesthesia related neurotoxicity with parents? And as you can see here, only 90, 90, only 5%, close to 6% answered as part of a routine risk discussion, and 90% of the 100 participants answer only if asked. And I think that we, we strongly feel that when parents come to bring their ch children for an anesthetic, they're already anxious, they're already stressed out enough for us to tell them some of us feel that way. More information, some people feel different way that they want to disclose everything and what could potentially be, what could be something significant or not. Um, modification of anesthetic technique to minimize risk. Uh, most of us answer, answer that we have not modified on our technique, although I can tell you that I personally have changed a, a few things myself mm -hmm. that I'll talk to you about later. Okay, so everything that I show you so far in regards to perception and what we think has been from the American perspective, but what does the European community think? Uh, so this was a survey among European anesthetists. There were 377 responses from 32 European countries, and these were not only pediatric hospitals, these were also general, like needs practices, where uh, children's hospitals within bigger hospitals as well. This is a very similar answer. There's no consensus regarding the relevance of the potential of neurotoxicity, the neurotoxicity of the anesthetic drugs. And again, the importance of a more focused, the importance of maybe shifting the, de the debate on focusing more on the, on the, on anesthetics being uh, delivered safely and, uh, and appropriately, especially in the neonatal period. And they felt that the question should have not been made public with the current evidence by the FDA. This is what the Euro European community answered. 60% of the anesthesiologists say, say do, they do not inform. Um, and probably around 20% said that yes. And then the other, the other group said that only if the, ch if the child is less than a year old. How about the surgeons? They also surveyed the surgeons and about 72 surgeons answer and 50% of the surgeons didn't really understand what was happening and 40% did not feel well informed. 
uh, and 40% described a little bit of a change in practice. Maybe thinking very carefully about doing non-elective procedures before a certain, a certain uh, age. Again, the need for further research. Because of all these things, there has been a big movement in the European community and in the American community. And there's the Safe Thoughts ini Initiative. And there's also a European initiative to provide guidance on the safe conduct of pediatric anesthesia that puts a lot of emphasis in education and research. Uh, I proudly have one of my fellows here uh, uh, with me, and, and I believe that it is extremely important to train anesthesiologists that know how to provide pediatric anesthesia in the safest way. Um, again, the importance of the guidance on markers of quality anesthesia care, having good quality uh, measures, uh, disclosing uh, when things happen, and learning from those things, uh, and the importance of teaching, training, and education, as I told you before. Uh, there, uh, the pediatric anesthesia community, I think, is even paying more attention now to a uh, definition of controlling hemodynamics in the operating room even more carefully, being careful with hy hypocarbia because we know the neonatal experience has shown that babies that had uh, were hypercarbic in neonatal intensive care units had poor outcomes compared to uh, children that were uh, normal capnic or a little hypercapnic, and of course the avoidance of hypotension as well. Um, and that's why I decided to show you that we are thinking about that too. Uh, Do Dr. McCann from Boston Children's and her, co um, and her colleague uh, just uh, published this review article recently, again, uh, encouraging the pediatric anesthesia community to collaborate with the neonatology community in looking into all these things such as hypotension, hypocarbia, and what you are doing, for instance, looking at NEARS and ways to uh, determine uh, brain perfusion, uh, how does that correlate with blood pressure management and things like that. Uh, I told you that not every center has assumed the uh, strategy that we have taken here of not necessarily telling the parents unless they ask us. Texas Children's has actually a sheet and they have a really well-established protocol that they collaborated with surgeons and they instituted actually at surgeons' offices of disclosing this information to the parents when the parents, before the parents decide if they want to proceed with the general, with the surgery and with the anesthetic, of course, for, for, for their child. Um, and this is what they discuss. Because anesthesia or sedation is necessary, discuss the following items with your doctor before the procedure. One, should the procedure be done now or when the child is older? Two, how long is the, is the procedure expected to take? And then three, will repeated or additional procedures be needed? So those are very relevant questions and they're having them in the surgeon's office with the guidance of the anesthesia team, with the parents. The Smart Thoughts Initiative is a, a, an initiative that is a collaboration between the Interna um, International Anesthesia Research Society and the FDA in order to keep looking at, at all the data of on neurotoxicity and general anesthetics and to keep the public informed uh, on, on anything that is new and relevant that may shift how we uh, deliver care for our patients. There's current research being funded by Smart Thoughts, as you can see there. Uh, that is ongoing research, so more to be told in the near future. I don't think the topic is going to go away. I think it's reassuring what's, what we've seen lately, but this is going to continue. I, I told you a little bit about the, the phenomenon, of, of phenomenon of environmental enrichment because I think it's important to think in those terms too. We cannot not anesthetize people, but can we do something if there's potential for toxicity or is there's pot potential for a certain damage. So actually one of our uh, bench anesthesiology researchers here, Dr. Nagib at the Cleveland Clinic, looked at two groups of rats and exposed them to six hours of isofluorine versus placebo and then enriched the environment with play and I don't remember what else he made the rats do. But what he found was that the rats that were, that were given that 
extracurricular activity or whatever they did to enrich them after the anesthetic had reversed their, the, the, the deleterious effect of the anesthetic that they were measuring was reversed. So I think it's an interesting thing, uh, an interesting idea to, to think on those terms as well. Again, epigenetics and the effect that the environment can have even on reestablishing something that had been damaged before is interesting. And this is pretty much their cartoon on how uh, this histone, histone deacetylase DNA methyl transferase may be one of the enzymes that plays a key role. And they're talking about these deacetylators that uh, is like future uh, medications that could potentially reverse the effect. Okay, this is our own Eunice Moon, uh, one of our interventional radiologists, and this is one of your own patients in the neonatal ICU. And ever since we started using dexmedetomidine, and I know that you also in the NICU uh, have been using it more, um, uh, this is a patient that was less than four weeks old and had nephrostomy tubes and came a couple of times to the interventional radiology suite and I had the opportunity to anesthetize him. He wasn't really little as you can see, he was your abnormal chubby NICU baby uh, because he was pretty healthy otherwise, but I used dexmedetomy pretty much as the sole anesthetic with a little bit of fentanyl and she used a little bit of local in, without intubating, without giving anything else, without exposing the baby to anything else that could be deleterious because dexmedetomy, as you can see in, in this paper, has been shown in at least in nine preclinical studies to potentially actually have neuroprotective effects on the brain. So what they do is they expose rats to general anesthetics and at the, concomitantly they give them dexmedetomy and they observed that they, there's not neuroapoptosis or that it can be also reversed. So uh, it, the conclusion of one of the studies is that dexmedetomy attenuates isoferrin induced injury in the developing brain, providing potential neuroprotection. So I can tell you that I have changed my practice, that I don't give everybody dexmedetomy, but when I have a child that is less than three years old, that is coming to the operating room for a procedure that is longer than three hours, I do use dexmedetomy as an infusion. Because if it can be potentially neuroprotective, why not? One, two, it's gonna decrease also the amount of general aesthetic that I can give to my patient, and it also has potential analgesic and sedative properties, so it's a win-win. This to show you, and this I just got it also online from this month, it's a systematic review. It's not even printed yet, the article. It's a systematic review on dexmedetomy and, and all the clinical and all the non-clinical data, meaning like preclinical and animal data that we have. And it shows that it can be advantageous regarding neurotoxicity. They look, the results of all their clinical studies suggest that neuroprotection profile in animals. Eight out of 11 studies demonstrated neurodexmedetomy itself not being, not generating apoptosis. Now, three of the studies show a little bit of apoptosis, but the doses that were used was, were extremely high. So that's one thing to consider. And then 13 out of the 16, stud 16 studies found beneficial neuroprotective effects when they were co-administered with other anesthetics, so potentially not as much damage. So it is, I don't have any financial uh, gain, but I think it may be kind of like for now, one of those wonder drugs that we, we have at our disposal. Uh, and lastly, I wanted to bring up to you a little bit about regional anesthesia, because I know that uh, when your, your patients come back to the, uh, a neonatal ICU with, with catheters, epidural catheters. Uh, you guys are always wondering, oh, how safe is this? How long should we leave the catheter for? And this is the, the, the only study that I know that uh, has looked at that. So we have uh, the Pediatric Regional Acute Network, which is a consortium of 20 institutions, of which the Cleveland Clinic is part, where we collect data, any regional block, 
you call it peripheral nerve catheter or epidural catheter that is placed or done in any pediatric patient at the Cleveland Clinic is entered at this registry. So a group of these investigators look at the neonates and uh, children that were less than four weeks old and then they looked at potential for adverse effects uh, of, of, of all these epidural catheters, neuraxial catheters, and they found that the, the incidence of serious complications is 0.3%. They found 41 complications out of 307 neonates, and that may seem super high to you, but what they found was catheter dislodgement, catheter contamination, and mostly vascular puncture, so passing the catheter and maybe getting blood back, and at that point usually the anesthesiologist just withdraws the needle or the catheter. Those kinds of, the, of um, adverse events was what they found. Uh, so in conclusion, they concluded that it's probably safe to, uh, to um, proceed with this type of techniques in the neonatal population. Why am I bringing this up? Because if we can control pain well in the neonate, and this is an adjuvant technique that we can use, we minimize the amount of morphine or the amount of other sedatives that we give that could potentially be beneficial. Of course, we always have to weigh the risks and the benefits of, of doing it. So what can we do? We always wonder as anesthesiologists, should we, should we be consolidating anesthetics? It makes sense because when you start over with a second anesthetic, there's downtime. When you wake up, there's, there's more time. So it makes sense, but we don't have data about that. Do we need efficient? You bet we need to be efficient. The least amount of time that we keep our patients in the NICU, in the open room, they exposed to different things, potentially the better they're going to, to do. Educate parents and surgeons, uh, well, absolutely, and of course, uh, educate each other, and that's why I'm here, and thank you so much for the opportunity, because I think it's really important. Use regional anesthesia. We have a little bit of data on how we think it may be safe, and there's no significant adverse events from using it. Use the exmedetomy in infants for surgery is longer than two hours in children three years old or less. There are lots, a lot of a couple of studies, actually one called the T-Rex and NOR study looking at cardiac patients and dexmedetomy that are gonna be coming up in the next few years. And I again I I think it's a good idea if it's gonna be a long surgery and it's a young child. And then, of course, the importance of future of further research on repeated exposure, prolonged exposure, and vulnerable groups. For you as a group, this is an invitation to, con to collaborate, to do further research, to ask the question, do we actually even know what happens to the NICU patients that are being sedated for three, four, five, seven days, 10 days with dexmedetomin? Do we have long-term outcome data? Can we compare patients that have been sedated with one thing versus the other or a combination of things? Uh, so there's uh, opportunity for research here um, and, and we should be looking into that. Uh, thank you very much. I have a lot of references. This is just a few of them uh, and I welcome any questions. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.